G'day, g'day. Hope you're all well. It's the coach here, and we are talking all things Stormcast Eternals. Put down your dragon fire. We're not talking dragons today. Magog, my guest from the Stormkeep, went 5 and 0 at the LVO, placed at the top 10, well, top eight, top eight, um, ran through the finals, did a great job. And he has joined us live to talk Stormcast. We are going to talk all things not dragons. G'day and hey welcome. Guys. Yeah, nice to be here. Thanks for having me on. No, it's a pleasure. And I just had to put that pre- uh, that like that prefix up because um, people will go, oh, dragons, dragons, like they're just OP. Like, you know, like, no, you you didn't actually run dragons. Not to say that people running dragons are bad. I'm not saying that I run. I have mm-hmm. Krondus Karazai and five at the moment. Um, Wow. I've saved one just. I've saved one just in case um, the rumors are true. Rumor upgrade through, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that rumor yeah, yeah, is yeah. true, I've got a spare dragon because they want to build it and then kind of get gutted. So I've Same. got I've got one dragon hold just in case. Uh, mm-hmm. But I've got Krondus and Karazai. I haven't magnetized. I've got both of them. Um, it's all like my my general's handbook twenty twenty two project. But dragons aside, that there's I've actually got a show about them with somebody else. We mm-hmm. are talking all things Stormcast and your run. And I really, to understand the uh, Annihilande, Annihilande, Annihilande Grande, Annihilande Grande, yeah. Annihilande Grande, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm sure people can unpack and understand what the build is. But I thought I'd bring a different perspective because most people are talking about either um yeah dragons of some variety but uh Mm -hmm. before people don't uh, people who happen don't know the storm keep by the way subscribe to them awesome stormcast focused content i know they delve a little bit more into other things i know you spoke to levan the other week for his uh, zombies but very focused and tactical uh channel focused on stormcast and really unpacking where you are in the meta and tactics and tips and all the good things but introduce yourself to the world uh, hey guys, uh, I'm Ragonk, uh, one of the co-hosts of the Stormkeep. Uh, I've been playing Age of Sigmar for about three and a half years, uh, close to four actually. And um, I picked up Stormcast Eternals in a store. It was the old Thunder and Blood box with Corn and Stormcast. Um, I decided to pick up the core book and read about their rules. And I guess I really just like that aesthetic of these immortal but tragic heroes who are slowly losing their humanity. Uh, giving off these very Romanesque and Viking uh, vibes, and uh, I don't know that that lore about how they're fighting, but they're also human. They're very much connected to their humanity. Is uh, was what's appealed to me over something like because I remember people making fun of them at the time, saying they were basically Sigmarines or Space Marines. Um, and having delved into the lore of both, I really like the story behind Stormcast. And yeah, it's the fa- it's my primary faction. I do uh, delve here and there into other factions every now and then, but. Um, I love playing them. They're a wide variety of units and tactical choices, and I and I think it's a super interesting army to play once you get into the weeds. So, yeah, if people watch this channel from like day one, I think I've gone on a journey. I initially didn't like Stormcast. One, I don't like the Chunky Boys. Um, mm-hmm. I've really fallen in love with this new, you know, thinner, uh, sleeker um, armor Strike armor. Understrike. Yeah. yeah, really yeah. fallen in love with that. But mm-hmm. I, I I hated the the force down my throat Stormcast. And, uh, you know, like it was very much like just forced down my throat. But, like, I, I listened to Hallowed Night, uh, the, the audio book, and I've checked mm-hmm. out a few others. Yeah, and they're, they're growing on me. They're definitely growing on me. And um, I think I'm still on the minds of, like, keeping heads on as opposed to helmets to kind mm-hmm. of have a little bit of that human thing. But I also see the other side. I know some people like the, you know, the plainless warrior just mm-hmm. get in there and smash face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Um I definitely like the Thunderstrike armor more. I think giving them that more sleeker medieval look is better. I, I will say though, the as far as the chunky boys go, I think the Sacrosanct Chamber with the Evocators and Sequiturs of the Robes, that's probably my next favorite. Like if you had to make chunky boys, give them flair. Like I, I guess Something. you know. Yeah. It's ironic because I'm actually I'm actually trying to convert my Stormcast using uh robes like like the it's so funny because i'm basically trying to replicate the that those um Sacrosanct Sacrosanct chamber, chamber models yeah. on yeah. on the thunderstrike, thunderstrike because I'm yeah. using, it's true like i'm learning how to green stuff and robe and um and it's not so, so i love sacrosanct i have nothing to confirm this but there is a bit of art 
about the Thunderstrike Stormcast where we see a Thunderstrike Evocator. So I, I, I might, I, I can't remember where I saw it, but I, it's definitely there. That's a, <laughs> be on the lookout. <laughs> I've got, I've got a, I've got a crack theory or I've got a crack idea that I'm exploring. I'm basically making my world a whole lot harder to convert Stormcast. And like, if you just run them <laughs> as they are, but I've decided to like pull together like Black Templar bids, Sisters of Battle bids, uh, oh, Bretonia yeah. bids. Like I've just Absolutely. got, I've lost the plot. I just ordered a whole bunch of bits last night. But hey, this is not the bit show. This is the uh, Talking Stormcast. And I really want to un unpack, well, I mean, obviously your tournament experience, your LVO, where are you at? What Stormcast good at? Um, you know, really understand that journey so that as a either a, an aspiring Stormcast player or someone who's doing okay and they want to get better, mm -hmm. can learn the lessons of your LVO run and understand, you know, what were you building towards? And folks... We will get into the list um, and we'll talk a bit about the rules as well. But really, let, let's start at the tournament. Why Stormcast? Why is it that you took Stormcast as opposed to any other faction? Um, I think I, the re primary reason I take Storm, took Stormcast is, A, they're my primary faction. They're my favorite faction. Um, LBO 2022 is not the first time I ran Stormcast. I actually ran them two years ago at LBO 2020. And this is when the book was not in the best shape, let's say. Uh, but having the new Battle Tome, I was just so excited to be able to run it at a major GT. Um, and the second reason is I, the Stormcast book has such a wide variety of tactical choices and unit choices. I really wanted to, I guess, be an example to people to be like, okay, we, like yes, dragons are the new hotness. Everybody knows this. But what can I do to make a list that can sort of go off brand and still put up a good showing? Because Stormcast have very powerful tools and you know very a good selection of tactical choices. They're pretty straightforward, sure, but they have a lot of like internal depth. And I think it's good. To, it was very exciting for me to explore that, and I wanted to do that in a tournament setting. So, yeah, no, that's that's cool because I guess you know, like when when we look at your list eventually, um, one of the things that you'll quickly notice is that you didn't take not just dragons, but you didn't take foot dragons. There was no formulators and oh, no dracoths. Nope. Nope. There was no dracoths at all. Like there was literally no dragons, which makes me wonder, you know, you obviously made that as a purpose choice, right? You're like, right, I'm not gonna take the filth, or I'm not gonna mm -hmm. take this build. Mm -hmm. Why, why, why if you're going to a major tournament? Because this is probably one of the challenges that people have in general. I'm building mm -hmm. a list to go to a tournament and I have a cool concept idea. Maybe it's a little bit off brand. I ask my friends for feedback and they just tell me, take dragons, take fulminators, take long strikes, take, you know, the whatever people are talking about in the meta. Mm -hmm. And as a player, you, you have two choices. Do I A, just follow suit and abandon my concept? Or do I B, do I take up the fulminators, the long strikes? And like, you know, insert any name here, Sentinels, Bow Snakes, Marathi, you know, whatever faction you're playing. That choice was obviously a purposeful one. Did you were you okay with that going into the tournament, knowing that you wouldn't have those top tier models? Did you have expectations on yourself going in? Were you okay knowing that you know if you had some losses or maybe you didn't go as well, mm -hmm. that you kind of knew you were doing something off? I guess I'm trying to like under unpack this a little because people yeah. are probably yeah, feeling yeah. conflicted when they listen. Yeah. Um, so actually, I took a very similar version of this list to the uh, GW Open in Austin in November. Uh, I changed up my list for LVO based on experiences in that meta and then further testing in the next month or two. Um, but initially, my when I looked at the War Scroll for Annihilators, I'm like, well, this is really powerful. Uh, people don't realize it, but it's actually pretty, really quite good. Um, and I think what, what I saw the meta becoming was everyone takes... It, War Scroll A or War Scroll B in their book, which is obviously very pushed. So something like those snakes, dragons, whatever. Then they try to fit it into a battle regiment. They try to go into that battle regiment saying, I'll give my opponent the first turn. I'll take the second turn. And if I win the double, the game's over. And I wanted to build something specifically that says, I don't care about if you have a battle regiment. I can go second all day. I can go first all day. I, don't, I do not care. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to, I guess, focus on was... I wanted, so when I first built Stormcast back in 2019, 2018, 
um, Soul Wars had just come out and the really popular list around that time was, and I really loved the concept, was the Gabriel Shurhart, where you dropped yeah. him and you dropped evocators alongside him and they made the six inch charge with his command ability. Um, so to having that access to play like Stormcast do in the lore, where they arrive in storms of lightning and they just strike you hard and just right there, like something out of a, something out of the uh, 3.0 trailer, actually, where the Annihilators land alongside the Imperit and, and they hit the Cruel Boys. I wanted to do something like that. That's It's, it's cool to me. Um, and Dracots are great, don't get me wrong. They are an alternate hammer unit, but they they are not good for Scion. You can't you, you can Scion them in, but their nine in charges, in my opinion, aren't reliable which means they will need reliable delivery mechanisms to get across the board and your opponent that, which means your opponent is going to know where they're going to be. So I wanted that surprise factor of keeping my opponent guessing where uh, I could always drop and then keeping them on their toes and, you know, messing with their positioning. And I'm like, if I can, I know that there's more, probably more powerful units out there, but if I can keep them guessing and on their toes, I have a favorable chance of that matchup. That being said, I was very nervous about the Dragons matchup. And uh, I'll discuss this when I go into my list. Um, it's particularly because Unleash Hell <laughs> is an amazing ability to have for you know two to four dragon breaths. And unfortunately, my main killers, the things that the lists are named after, the Annihilators, is you know they're not very good at fighting that at all. Um, and I'll discuss this later because there was a variation in my Austin list and my LVO list, and now I'm sort of I made I made another list, which is my final version of this list, which is a mix of the two. So, yeah. So I'll I'll discuss this when that list goes. But uh, yes, I was very nervous about the dragons matchup. I was expecting to go four one, maybe like three two if I had an off day. Um, but luckily, I managed to avoid dragons because they were just scoring so high. They constantly kept getting matched up against each other. So I kept sort of just getting by and by and by, and until finally I faced a really good counter in Laban, and his list is just so brilliant. It's it was. It's almost like he studied the meta, he knew what it was about, and he decided to counter it perfectly. And I love that style of thinking. And yeah, and so this my the list that I built was basically meant to counter most of the meta lists. I want to unpack that a little bit. That's so cool because you're right. Like when you look at the top eight at the LVO, there was definitely a few off meta lists. You know, the Phoenician and and Levan's two mm -hmm. perfect examples, right? You had this uh, 120 zombie plus mega gargant. Um, mm -hmm. Soul Black Grave Lords. You also had this Mortal Wound, I give zero Fs um, build of yeah. the Phoenician Double Phoenix, Phoenix Guard. Couldn't care less about your Mortal Wounds because everything had like a four up. So, you know, you throw dragons and breathe dragon fire at me. Um, I don't care because, you know, it's not a lot of mortals. Um, obviously, Forminators aside, but obviously we're going into to, to a tournament and I think probably for anyone who listens to this, that doesn't go to tournaments, don't go to tournaments very often. There's always the challenge of, do I try to build and try to counter them, the, the meta, whatever the top five armies might be at the time, but you also might not run into it. You know, there's been times where I've gone to a tournament and let's say Zinch was at its hottest. I, 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 I don't play Zinch, but then there's been yeah. times at tournaments where Ossiak Bone Reapers, Petrifix Elite is really popular, and I played them three out of five times at a tournament. You just can't tell your run. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 one of those things where you just, you know, you need to. The only game you need to be worried about is the one you're playing, and that's it. You know, don't think about too much about the meta and what you meant. You just, you just when you see your opponent's army, you talk to them, and then you go, okay, this is how this army plays. What is my path to victory here? Um, and as long as you do that, I think you'll have a good time. Yeah. And, you know, and then like, you know, Neil in the comments made a good comment about just chariots, right? Because, um, I got really interested. Obviously I got, um, the games, the, I got the Stormcast book in advance from Games Workshop. They were kind enough to send it to me. And I'm looking at so many war, you know, really cool war scrolls from the, is it the Night Judicator? You know, you're the chariots, you've got the double version of the, um, the Annihilators, both with Grand Hammer and Shield, right? Mm -hmm. There's just... You know the praetors there's just so many bloody cool units that are added on top of they've made liberators and you know even prosecutors and things like that have become really cool how on earth did you whittle down to a list to i'm gonna have a drink i'm losing my voice how yeah. did you whittle down a list to to get to a point where it was competitive and you thought it was going to act in the meta good in the meta 
Um, okay, so uh, back in LBO 2020, I played a list, and actually this is how I met Paul and the Stormkeep. Uh, we were on the TGA forums, and we were discussing a list called Anvil Strike. And back, this was when Slanesh, Fire Slayers, and the three up save Petrifex Elite Army were ruling the roost in melee combat. So the question was, the Gav can't do anything. How do we even how do we even beat this? And well, he said, well, don't participate in melee. Just just shoot them. <laughs> um, and so back then we were running nine long strikes in Endles of the Helden Hammer to shoot twice each turn. Um, and then back, but and then we discovered that shooting alone wouldn't solve problems uh, because objectives cannot be taken by shooting units. You need things that charge and take over objectives and stay there. And so we came up with the idea of 10 evocators, uh, a block of 10 evocators supported by a Knight Heralder so they could run and charge every turn. And the Knight Heralder with his little duding horn just blowing rocks on people and causing Sylvanet Wildwood players to really hate themselves. Um, so <laughs> that was quite fun. Um, and then when you know when this new tome came out, uh, evocators took a hit. Uh, they weren't as reinforceable as before um, because they lost their two-inch reach. So no more attacking in two ranks with the new coherency. Um, but Annihilators just seemed like the spiritual successor because if Evocators mm. were the guys getting into combat and then doing that Celestial Lightning arc at the end of combat, Annihilators were doing all their mortal wounds up front. They would land, do mortal wounds, they would charge, do mortal wounds, and then they would just swing in with minus two rend three damage and just absolutely wreck something. Um, and so the idea was more or less, it's a, so, so this list is almost like the successor to that list where you have a sniper's nest in the form of your Vanguard Raptors, and you're dropping these, uh, to reference Halo, these orbital dop shock, shock troopers, basically in key spots around the battlefield to deal with threats as they come by, so. No, it's good. Like it's, um again, you know, playing, playing in this game since first edition, there's always been a version of this build. You know, I remember back in the day where it was at the Warrior Brotherhood Battalion where you could drop down Stormcast near uh was it the knight of xeros knight, knight of xeros yeah he used to guide people yeah, in yep yeah correct he'd guide them in then they you know there were some shenanigans there you know there's always been this type of build as you said the gav build you've got um even like prime time as well prime time dropped from the sky yeah, yeah has yeah, that yeah. dice that yeah, he's able to like re-roll so he can automatically get into the charge he's powered up so you know it's very been, been very thematical and and I, I, even like with Annihilators, and um, I don't want to go down too down the path of Annihilators just yet. I know that people talked a lot about that early on when there was a minor mm -hmm. rule clarification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then like the minute that they couldn't move, was it, correct me if I'm wrong, was it you dropped from the sky, then you could move? Or what was the thing they clarified that you can't do now? So I remember there was something with Annihilators that seemed to turn people off. Um, I think what turned people off was the, uh, I, I might be wrong on this, but uh, it could be the reroll charge because so they have an innate reroll charge built in the turn they land, and it's like if I translocate them, or like if I if I'm playing on a uh, mission that's like tooth and nail where I have I cannot deploy them in the sky, can I translocate them and they still do their mortal wounds the first time they uh, land? I think the answer was no, mm -hmm. um, and I'll discuss this when we go into you know discuss the list from the uh, top down, but. Um, yeah, I think it was something like that. Plus, I think tr not being, being able to move after translocation when they finally fixed that, when the new tone came out, I think that weakened their mobility post-drop from Scions. So. <clears throat> All right. We, we have mentioned we'll talk about it later too often. I'm just going to pull up some rules and let's actually get into the meat and potatoes of this. So what I've got here, first off, is the Stormcast rules because... Your list, you went um, the signs of the storm as opposed to the storm keeps. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why I've got storm keep up there. Ignore me, folks. It's clearly signs of the storm. Decision tree. I've got two options. Why am I going signs of the storm um, over the storm keep? Mm -hmm. Well, the most obvious reason would be annihilators do most of their things via scions. Uh, they need mobility. They move only four inches uh, and. Their entire war scroll is built around dropping from the heavens, doing mortal wounds, and then charging your opponent at key spots around the battlefield and being able to do that almost anywhere on the battlefield. But more to my decision as to why I didn't build a Stormkeep list in the first place, I think a Stormkeep-based list that focuses around the Shield of Civilization, where all your Redeemer units start counting as uh, uh, three models each for the first uh, two turns on home objectives, and then for everywhere on the board, I think, turn three, 
it's a good idea. I think it's not a bad idea. And you can play this sort of attritional Stormcast list, which can uh, just you know keep outnumbering other players on objectives. I think the problem was Gargans, mainly. Because mm. Gargans are just flat out better than you at it. Like, yes, I can take 10 Vindictors, and they will count as you know 30 models from a Taker tribe. But all the Gargan player has to do is get lucky and kill two Vindictors. And then, or one Windictor, and the, now they're winning, winning over objectives, and you don't have the offensive power to weather that storm on objectives. Uh, whereas, no matter how many wounds you deal to them, unless they take exactly thirty-five or forty wounds or whatever, they're not—they always count as thirty. You know, so I think and Gargans were such a popular army in Austin, um, and they certainly were popular at LVO too. That I just didn't feel right taking a Stormkeep list and sort of playing that attritional uh, style. So I was like, okay. I'm not going to try and compete with the objectives. I will play the five round game where I try to kneecap your army and then I'll take over objectives. And given that I really wanted to play Annihilator, Scions was the pick. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I actually literally 12 hours ago had a game um, and I played up against Stormcast with my Megas. So I'm taking um, I'm taking Megas um, to a tournament next weekend. And I was having this game and it was more of a coaching game. I mean, not the player needed the coaching but we were having a good conversation and I was, I was challenging this go. We, we, we kind of set this in advance and I'd said, why are you doing this? Cause I remember the first thing he was going to do was he was going to translocate the four formulators. He took the top of the turn one. And I said, why are you doing that? And we talked through some rationale and I said, look, if it fails, I'm potentially going to double turn you, you lose those four formulators. You've really got nothing left to win the game. You've got a, a bunch of, you know, vindictors, you've got a long strikes, You've got uh, Bastion, but overall, like I've got three megas, uh, or sorry, two megas, a small and Kragnos. Um, mm -hmm. I was relatively confident that I'd be able to just win. So the attrition game, you're right, at the moment might not be the right play. Certainly in your style, I like the Stormkeep. And funnily enough, in my Stormcast build, I have flipped over to Scions because I was playing Dragons with Karazai. I'm taking Big Dragon. And I was finding that I was having to babysit Gardas too much with, you know, having yes. to translocate Gardas. And I thought to myself, why don't I just move my sub allegiance? Because I don't really need it. Mm -hmm. And then put Gardas in the sky and then drop Gardas where I need him, as opposed to having to always rely on the Relictor to be moving Absolutely. around constantly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that is the play. Like, uh, like don't get me wrong like if i'm running a stormkeep list which is based around liberators or vindictors and i'm just trying to win over objectives gardas is a in my opinion a must take um mm. just like you you want you, if you want to play the attritional style gardas is your go-to uh but yes in more offensive styles of more mobile units such as storm drake guard annihilators or uh karazai Krondis, whatever uh yeah it helps to have scions to have key amounts of positioning because you only get one translocate so which probably to, so maybe before I jump onto your choice of the Knight Excelsior, um, mm -hmm. what what are the type of good units that um, you would consider? Because sometimes the decision tree is: do I start off with sub allegiance or sub allegiance? Or sometimes it's like I'm going to choose my unit selection and then I'm going to try to find a sub allegiance that better suits the choices that I want. Like these are the models that I own. These are the things. This is the concept that I want to build around. Mm -hmm. What are the what are the good units that you think fit well into Scions? Or if I had a, t a type of build, you know, whether it's, you know, long strikes or judicators, if it's going to be chariots, if it's going to be dragons, like who fits well in the Scion type of build? I think every Stormcast unit fits well in the Scion type, type of build. Whereas, in my opinion, only Redeemer units fit well into Stormkeep. And and it's not it's not it's not like a preference thing. It's just like all Stormkeep is doing is making Redeemers better. So if you're really in love with the Stormcast battle line foot troops and you want a way to make them work, absolutely. And I mean, I guess you can take Cities of Sigmar coalition units, but in my opinion, I haven't really seen that many great Cities of Sigmar units that I would take because other than maybe the Frostheart Phoenix, which has that like, amazing minus one to Wound Aura, there aren't that many units that really do what Stormcast need to be doing better than Stormcast. Um, okay. Maybe some Iron Drakes, maybe perhaps for some a bit of shooting, but uh, but, but you've but got so just... many good shooting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it's like if I'm taking yeah, and the other thing about the the reason I don't take Stormkeep and I choose Scions, 
Scions isn't just a positioning and offensive tool, it is perhaps the best defensive tool in the game. With how powerful range projection has gotten uh, in recent months, or you could say a year, or in the course of the game, like with magic, with umbral spell portal, with long strikes, with dragons, the best way to protect your units is to have them not be there. Mm. And what does that better than Scions? You know, they can't target something that's not there. So, and that's probably another reason as well, because if I, you know, what I found, you know, last night with Cron, uh, not Crondus, um, Kragnos is that he was just a prime target um, mm -hmm. on the table, right? Um, he was dead after four rounds of shooting. It took a long time between, you know, Bastien's abilities, um, long strike shooting the hero face for that one once per game. You know, there was very little I could do to protect Kronda. Uh, he was saying Krondus, uh, <laughs> Kragnos on the table. But the same is true for any units that you want. You know, if mm -hmm. we get into a meta where there is, I don't know, an, uh, a super fast durability, Iron Jaws are going to run into your face and you don't have any good screens and, you know, you want to protect your block of four dragons, as an example. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, in Scions, you can definitely take it off the table and, cool, let them move up the table and then you can kind of come where you want to play. And you saw that kind of work really well with Gavin um, when he played Living Cities. That you know, having models in reserve is very powerful for uh, for objective scoring, for battle tactic scoring, for denying grand strategies, um, yeah. and just overall, just picking the battle. I think sometimes you can find yourself fighting where you don't want to be fighting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's it's a it's everything. It's and I can understand why. Like when you look at Stormcast, other books they have a page of allegiance abilities, and then you see Stormcast, it's one paragraph. Signs of the storm, and like, it might seem like, oh, wow, didn't they think Stormcast deserve other abilities? And it's like, yeah, well, Blaze of Glory is nice, but you need to understand how good Scions really is. Being able to deploy half your army and not be available for your opponent to target, shoot, or do anything with, and you can dictate the course of the engagement over the course of the game is actually a really strong ability. So, so talk to me a little bit more about Scions, right? So with Signs of the Storm, um, obviously you have to put one, one unit on the table, and then I can put mm -hmm. one in reserve. First question, do you always do a 50-50 split? Just because uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. So absolutely. do you always 50-50? No, not at all. Um, so I'll give you a prime example. So in my opinion, annihilators will always go in the sky, right? That's 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 just what they do. They want to be in the sky. So that's a guarantee. But then there's other micro decisions you might have to make as to what to put in the sky or not. For instance, let's say you have Vanguard Raptors in your list or Adjudicators. But the army that you're fighting is also a heavy shooting army, and you are worried that they might go first. Great. Put Vanguard Raptors in the sky. Have them drop down where you need them to be on your turn so you get priority without them being shot off the board. But on the other hand, if you're fighting Iron Jaws and I have plenty of screens, and I know I'm going to be ranged turn one for Thunderbolt Wally, I'll put them on the ground. Um, and the same goes for things like Aether Wings. If, you're, if you know your opponent isn't playing a very mobile army and you want to quickly achieve a grand strategy by deploying an Aether Wing unit in their face, so Vanguard Raptors get a plus one to hit, or you get the, uh, what is it, Savage Spearhead or something uh, at Battle Tactic later on, you can put Aether Wings in the sky. There are games against magic heavy opponents where they will give me the first turn, and I know because that's how that army plays. Like for instance, the uh, uh, Zinch build, uh, the one with the Battle Regiment with the Umbral Spell Portal, they give me the first turn. So I usually deploy my Knight and Canter in the sky, and then I deploy them basically in range of Kairos so he can, uh, auto unbind the umbral spell portal if needs be so mm -hmm. it, it's all very dependent on what matchups you face what their range projection is like uh what units do you need to protect or position accordingly yeah no it's great because i think uh, especially for people who are getting you know new or newer or maybe still learning the faction it can be you know a, a lot the stormcast have a lot of choices you know you have the deepest rosters you have the most interesting combinations there, mm -hmm. there, and then obviously the the fifty up to fifty fifty split of going into the sky, and it's almost like, who do I put into the sky? When do I put it into the sky? When do I bring it down? Do I bring it down too early? What most people often do, I see, is they they hold it on too late, mm -hmm. and by then the impacts potentially are, are gone, uh, or you could have dropped them down one turn too early. And I, I guess this has been really helpful for, for people to start thinking about well. It's it's not what do I put into the sky, it's why am I putting it into the sky? What is it that I'm hoping to achieve? And as you've mentioned, 
the knight in Cantor unbind. It's protecting some of those key units that, you know, you put a lot of points into your long strikes, but you're not going to go first. So put them into reserve, hide them, so then you can drop them down when you want them, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to losing them before, you know, you've kind of got into second gear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this can go for cool. key heroes too. Like there are some matches where I would deploy uh, the Lord Imperitant in the sky. Some matches I don't really care because I want to deploy something else in the sky, perhaps. Um, but yeah, it, it's a, it's it all depends on do, do I want to protect something from range projection? Okay, put it in the sky. Does this thing need to be in the sky because it's too slow to position itself on the field? Otherwise, yes, put it in the sky, and then everything else can be on the ground. Cool. So I guess my just my, my my lesson here, folks, if you are uh, what still wondering what to do, is start thinking about your decision tree. Think about right. If I was to go up against a shooting list, you know, a Lumineth Realm Lords, uh, uh, you know, there's so many shooting armies. I don't have to rattle them all off. What would I want to protect from those shooting armies? And also, if I had like a, a, a Ogre Moor tribes or an Iron Jaws rushing up my face really early, what would I want to protect? So keep that in mind. And yes, you know, there's other tools like Mirror Shield, Jeremy, uh, good, Jeremy Garcia in the chat, good comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got other protections like Mirror Shield, which can help you for some builds, but certainly not other builds. So um, do keep that one in mind. The other part probably is then the Knight Excelsior, which probably caught me off initially because when I was going through lists and I'm having a look, you know, what's common is is um, ha Hammers of Sigmar. Hallowed Knights. And Hammers of Sigmar and Hallowed, Hallowed Knights. Knights. They're the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're the top two, you know. In previous editions, it was like Anvils of Held and Hammer, which were popular. But I'm looking through this like you sometimes see Celestial Vindicators. Um, you rarely see Astral Templars or Tempest Lords. Anvils mm -hmm. of Held and Hammer is essentially dead by dead, the looks yeah. of it. No one runs yeah. them anymore. But why on earth would you not only take an off-meta list, and take something like um, Bloody Annihilators that not many people are running. It's all about dragons and forminators. And mm -hmm. then take a sub allegiance that no one's taking. Like, you either are the ballsiest man in the planet or you've got some crack science. <laughs> uh, well, the science is it's not that ballsy. The simplest reason, and I, it's probably why people run uh, Hammers of Sigmar, is Paladins are battle line in Knights Excelsior. So if Fulminators, being as expensive as they are, can get to be Battle Line and Hammers of Sigmar, Knights Excelsior is the common take if you want to take lots of Annihilators. Um, their ability, which uh, is, uh, as the screen says, you can pick a unit within one inch of them, and if it's got, if, they, if, you're, if they're basically outnumbered in combat, they get a plus one to hit and plus one to wound. Uh, this actually doesn't come up in a monster-heavy meta currently, but I did find it come, come up a fair amount of times in uh, some matchups like Daughters of Cain, where I would charge their uh, Bow Snakes or their Witch Elves. And it's actually quite good, because this actually leaves you uh, free for an all-out defense. So you're effectively mm. on twos and twos across the entire army, because you can spend CP quite efficiently to give whatever is attacking that turn, whether it can be it can be Long Strikes, it can be your Knight Judicator, it can be Annihilators. And the core hitting parts of your army are always on twos and twos, which is amazing, as far as rolling dice is concerned. Um, so yeah, Knights Excelsior seemed like the pick. The plus one to hit's nice. Like it's like mm -hmm. it's like for me, the plus one to hit's just a nice thing. But really, it's a plus one to wound because there's so little ways to uh, boost pluses to wound, especially to troops. You obviously, you know, there are some uh, abilities in the game where you can get you through spells for heroes and things like mm -hmm. that, um, like Finest Hour. But mm -hmm. but to get it on troops. Did you find in your LVO journey that um, your Annihilators were getting to take advantage of that? Or were you seeing them into your monsters and single single model heroes? Oh, uh, I absolutely would send them. In. Uh, Annihilators can go basically anywhere. So the thing about Grand Hammer Annihilators, and this is why the reason is Annihiliana Grande, not just Annihiliana, is because Grand Hammers natively wound on twos, which is amazing which means all you need to do is give them a plus one to hit, either using a CP or this Knight's Excelsior trait. And they're always going to be on twos and twos. Now, I did consider Shield Annihilators, who are on threes and threes, minus one rent two damage. And this trait would really help them out. The problem is we're in a bit of a monster meta, uh, a lot of single model uh, armies and things, and just low model count in general popping up. So Shield Annihilators would not get to take advantage of, advantage of this trait as much. Um, and maybe that'll change in 
three, four months with a new GHB. But once that happens, if, if we do switch to a hard meta, uh, this trait will be extremely valuable because it leaves you free for a la defense, which means you're hitting on twos, winning on twos across any Paladin unit you can think of in Stormcast, and you are free for an all-out defense, which means puts every single Paladin unit you have on a two-up save or better. So. And Kevin uh, called out in the chat, very, very important. It is once per turn. Oh, yeah, it is um, one and per it's, turn. And yeah. It, and, and, yeah, and, 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 and so once per turn in the combat phase, so it's not your combat phase, so it means you can do it in both, both yours and your opponent's. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's one friendly, uh, one one um, Knight Excelsior Paladin. So if you had three units of Paladins, you'd have to pick one. It doesn't get to apply to the entire faction. So you obviously have the choice, but yeah, just mm -hmm. just don't think about that. Like, oh my gosh, I'm going to do this amazing Alpha Strike. I'm going to have three units in the sky. I'm just going to drop them down. They're all going to get plus one to hit, plus one to wound. No, it's just one. Mm -hmm. Still powerful, but just like just keep that content yeah. in mind. So do you do you build around the paladin, or do you like? Are you going to try to cram as many paladin models into your faction if you're going to try to take advantage of this nice Excelsior build, or are you just going to go for a couple of choices? Um. So th the idea with this list was so one of the main problems with the Gabriel Sure Charge Bomb list was the fact that you had to take three liberators no matter what. Um, if you want to take any other units, your list had to start with a three hundred point tax. And this thing reduces that tax by making Paladin's battle line. So ideally, you want at least two, at least two good Paladin units as battle line. And then you can, the third is a bit of a flex spot. You can have Vindictors or Liberators for a bit of screening. Uh, instead of Vanguard Raptors, you could probably go for 15 Judicators and free up, you know, just, just another battle line slot. Um, but I really wanted to lean in into Annihilators, just just all in. So I just went for three groups of three Annihilators, and those are my battle line. Cool. And we'll talk about the list, in, in, you know, very, very soon, because I can see a couple of questions coming around, you know, is there mm -hmm. value of having one unit of Shield Annihilators? You know, um, you know is, is all... yeah, you might as well answer now. Sure. Um, so Tactical Command, uh, I think yes, yes and no. So um and it's all very meta dependent. Shield Annihilators just don't do the amount of damage that you need for 200 points, but they have an excellent two up save, which means that they can hold very well. But the thing is like holding things generally doesn't win you the game because they're only three models. So whatever you're fighting will most likely tend to outnumber them. So if you're fighting over an objective, you have not taken over that objective. Um, I'd rather just pay the 40 points more to ensure whatever I'm charging is dead. Now this might very well change if the meta transitions more to uh, you know, just a horde meta, and you can shave off those 40 points and add something else in your list, then yes, I would consider Shield Annihilators. Uh, but right now, I think just for this, because we're so uh, leaning so hard into a meta that tries to DPS check Gargants, that I think I wanted to go full on Grand Hammers. Yeah, which is funny because literally that was the conversation I was having with my opponent last night was um, if I, if you, if you lose those Fulminators, you really don't have the, you know, your your chip mortal wounds from the long strikes. Well, I'll laugh at you. I can handle you. That's not a problem. But what I was concerned about was the fulminators. So that damage, you know, if you can you project enough power to kill a, a general or a mega gargan? Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely something to consider because you can't. I guess the reason we're worried about that as a stormcast player is because you you won't win the objective game without pulling them down. You can yep. chip at them. But if you if it takes you two turns to pull them down, then they're just going to keep outscoring you. So you know you especially if like the traditional four mega gargan build, you really want to be pulling down one a turn, um, so that you can not only be scoring those, those sweet victory points on killing a mm -hmm. monster and you know doing your own battle tactics, but also to be winning the objective because that will be the difference. Mm -hmm. And that'll just apply unless you're playing like a very numerical fo focused stormcast list or a stormkeep list. Uh, Stormcast are almost always going to be outnumbered on objectives. So you need to find a way to remove enemy models as fast as possible. Um, so Shield Annihilators are good at that, not great. And they're really good at holding things in place. But I just don't find the meta is in a place where that's necessary right now. And maybe that, that can easily, that can very well change. So. 
a, a good comment that's come out of the chat, which is an interesting one because my opponent was playing Hammers last night. Um, you might know him, Ox King, by the way. He's always yeah, I do, yeah, as well. Yeah. Great, le legendary guy, really, really fun game. Um, yeah, my poor crack Nosset took 12 mortal wounds before <laughs> my at the start of my sorry, at um, his he took top turn one, and um, by the his hero phase, crack Nos had already taken 12, so kind of made me cry a little bit just <laughs> from you know, all long strikes and bloody Bastion rolling 18 oh, yeah, plus no. Craggy and. Oh. Yeah, and then he did it to my Mega Gargant that had 40 wounds. So he gets to roll 40 dice against um, <laughs> one, my general. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good Bastion's the, ability. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Oh, he's a jerk. He's a jerk one. But the question out of the chat um, is around, you know, the, you know the, things like Annihilators have a two-up armor save. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of mortal wounds being thrown out. Not just Stormcast. A lot of people are looking at mortal wounds to cut through the armor saves. Do you think, you know, this type of list becomes hard when you start playing in this Mortal Wound game? Because, you know, Hammers of Sigma, for example, gives you that six-up ward, um, mm -hmm. you know, or even Hallowed Knights, you've got Guarders, you're going to get yourself a ward save. Mm -hmm. Do you think, like, Annihilators then become just absolute targets to be killed for with Mortals? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Uh, but so the way this list functions, and once we dive into the meat of the list and the actual list itself, I'll explain it further. But... I'm not expecting my Annihilators to survive after they land and delete what I need them to delete. What I am hoping for is if by some miracle, if my opponent doesn't focus them down, they will absolutely wreak havoc across their entire army. So it's almost like a distraction tool for me where I'm saying, here's my 240 points. It's in your face. It just killed something. And you know what its killing power is if it keeps charging and it keeps using, gets to use its uh, three damage Grand Hammer. I am going to all our defense it. I'm going to put it on a two up save. If you don't have them, if you don't focus it with some dedicated mortal wound output or some dedicated ren, you are going to lose a whole ton of units to this one unit just roaming around your battle. And that causes them to make decisions, which make space for my other two annihilators in the sky to land and do what they need to do. So by the end, I don't, I'm not real super expecting the annihilators to survive. It's more the idea of the annihilators are the best distraction ever that also cause a lot of damage. And if you're busy dealing with them, you're not worrying about my raptors, and that's what I want. And correct me if I'm wrong, you're you're really just looking for appropriate trades. You are saying, right, these three annihilators are going to come down from the sky, they're going to wreck face, but mm -hmm. by the end of the combats, I want to have killed more points than what I have traded with the three annihilators. Absolutely. Um, or at the least put them in a position where they have to feel like they have to make an unfavorable trade, where they have to commit five or 600 points to deal with a 240 point unit to make sure that unit doesn't you know, absolutely wreck them. Um, so I think that's a Stormcast concept in general. I think you have to find a way to make favorable trades for your units because you're just so highly elite that if your army isn't making tr upward trades or killing things above its points value, you most likely are losing. Um, yeah, and I think like this this goes to the army's design in general. And I think I had this conversation, or I tried to have this conversation on Twitter with someone on the U.S. Uh, team. And basically, like the argument was, Fulminator should be 340 points because they do about that much damage. And I said, if you do that, if you just start pointing Stormcast Eternals to where they're pointed exactly to what damage they do, the army's concept doesn't work because it's extremely elite. They will never take over objectives unless they can absolutely kill you. So if you so the entire idea of the army is to have them hit way above their weight class and to, for you to play them that way. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, th I think we can all agree Forminators are cheap. Um, the, oh, you know, you I, know, I, I know I'm not saying they couldn't use an adjustment. I don't think 340 is right. I think 260 would probably be better. <laughs> so. Look, I, I don't know the points value. I don't know the mathematics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We could all throw numbers up in the sky. If you mm -hmm. ask your opponent, he would say 7,000 points for a unit of two. <laughs> um, like, you know, like, and then the, some people would say remove coalition stuff, the cities of Sigma and, the, and the, you know, Kumbaya will be okay. But I think the reality yeah. is that, you you know, going back to the core, yes, it's looking for favorable trade-offs, right? And, you know, perfect example is um, let's say you've got an opponent and they've got a really interesting screen. I don't know, like it's 10 Ungor or something. Do you drop down the annihilators to charge and kill the the ungore, and then you your opponent takes the turn, maybe even double turns you, and then you don't get to charge and kind of keep moving? 
probably an unfair trade. So mm -hmm. now sometimes it might be important because the, you know, the, the next layer of your strategy is like, once you've removed those screens, then you can get into something, but it's I'm all about glad trades, you, ultimately. Yep. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the screen thing because um, I, I do have that, that scenario did crop up at LVO. It was against Daughters of Cain, I think. They had two units of Kinarai, uh, a whole bunch of Blood Snakes, and then two units of Witch Elves. And they had positioned in a way where I cannot land in their zone. I have to land in front of their army, to, uh, so to speak. Uh, as you notice, this list takes Thunderbolt Volley, which is the hero face shooting. Hero face shooting isn't just for killing big things or just double tapping into things. The most useful effect you can have is to be able to shoot screens off the board so you can position your annihilators end of the movement phase. Because shooting happens after movement, so you cannot position your annihilators after shooting. So the play here is to use Thunderbolt Volley, delete the Kinarai that are protecting or screening out his Witch Elves and Blood Snakes, and drop the annihilators into the meat of their army. And sometimes you will need to do that. You cannot just keep Thunderbolt Volley as this double tap mechanism to kill a key unit. Sometimes it's more of a positioning tool for the Annihilators. So, yeah. Yeah, Re really good call. Because, yeah, you might feel that you're wasting the Holy Command on a bunch of cheap chaff, right? It's like, oh, do I really want to do this? What happens if I don't kill X unit? But often you can't do what you want to do when there are screens and there are layers of screens. And this is kind of where my opponent last night, um, you know, when we were talking through things, he did a really good job because he created layer and layer of screens for my megas. And he just kept for keeping me back. And he was being really smart because we were talking through about if you drop down your Vindictors at X mm -hmm. range, he could, and he was worried about my Gargans throwing rocks at the, um, at the long strikes. Yeah. But he could drop a screen in such a way that he'd actually be outside of range. So the long strikes were, un you know, it, when he lost his turn or he should he get double turned, um, I wouldn't be able to throw rocks at those long strikes. So mm -hmm. um, thinking about screens, and that's where you could put, you know, your scions down just to create layers and chaff, uh, as well as um, dropping into key areas to kind of take out models and, you know, mm -hmm. target certain things. Absolutely, and uh, I've used I've used that strategy too. Uh, sometimes I'll put an Aetherwing unit in Scions, or um, I'll use Translocate from the Lord Relictor, because I'll measure out how far that Guardian can move and what their potential range of movement is and where they could possibly move. I have a spare uh, Guardian base, or I guess, and I'll and I'll measure that and I'll see. Okay, you cannot land on top of my model, so I'll put them right here. So you have to be way far out if you want to move anywhere. Um, and yeah, that's the strategy you'll have to employ. The uh, The idea is to buy time. This is not a very fast list. You typically will play, uh, you know, the full four to five rounds. So don't expect to just win off turn one and turn two. You know, be you have to be slow and methodical when trying to play this list. Yeah, yeah. Which was yeah, which was part of some of my conversation is you know you, if you if you uh, translocate these fulminators at the top of turn one and you fail the charge, you don't you know you don't hit it um and your dick's in the wind and you know now you're potentially going to get double turned will they survive the answer is probably no mm -hmm. what have you lost is it the fair trade the answer is probably no maybe don't do it so funnily mm -hmm. enough you actually failed translocation with a double one so uh, he rolled one <laughs> and then rolled another one so it actually worked in his favor in the end um uh, but you know you know what i mean so anyway before we get into the list i do want to ask just one quick question around the redeemer stuff with no, the paladin stuff sorry so mm -hmm. you've got what is it you've got your protectors your retributors what are the other paladin units that might you know if, if somebody didn't want to go all grand hammers uh annihilators oh there's i think there's the only five there's five it? paladin units protectors retributors decimators annihilators of grand hammers annihilators with shields and i think cool. those, those are and how does options. this how does this list differ if I had the same concept, but I flipped out the Paladin units to be, I don't know, Retributors or Protectors? Um, I think you would play more of a slower Castle Formation list, where this list is trying to be offensive with Mortal Wounds and uh, sort of just drop key units on opponents. Uh, your list would more be to protect your Vanguard Raptors inside your castle, and then as things come close to you and your objectives, your Paladins strike out and hit those key targets. And the idea would be to keep your Vanguard Raptors and Night Judicators uh, or Judicator uh, shooting the whole game to try and delete key uh, units your opponent has. 
Yes, this is more a much more aggressive style of build as opposed to a Paladin Retributor, which is probably a bit more of a balanced or at least defensive, but it's still got mm -hmm. offensive power. I mean, Retributors still hit well, but they don't yes. hit nearly as well as Annihilators. I mean, I'd say they hit about as well. I mean, they, they hit great. The problem isn't the hitting, it's the delivery. It's like, how do you deliver them into key units? You can have them come to mm. you or you can go to them. Annihilators are just better at going to them. Yeah, actually, look, looking at the Retributor War Scroll now, it's, they, hit, they have three attacks, hit on threes, wound on three. So with the buff, it'd be twos and twos, ren two for two. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on a two up, you do the, oh no, that's the, that's the mace. The mace does the D3 yeah. mortal wounds. And on a six, I think Retributors do two mortal wounds instead of the normal Yeah, damage. yeah, so unmodified hit rolls with the lightning hammer. So they've all got lightning hammers. So they've, they've still got good power, you're right. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's the delivery mechanism. Mm-hmm. And this is why, like, when translocation was nerfed, or not say nerfed, let's say balanced, uh, retributors did take a hit because if if they had kept that in just for the retributors, then I don't know, they could have been viable. I think. And by the way, when we talk about uh, delivery mechanism, we're talking about the blazing impact rule, where it's uh, after the setup of the unit on the battlefield for the first time, roll the dice. Uh, oh no, that's that's, that's the charge move. Sorry. No, no, we're no, talking. So in this case, we're talking about the Lord Imperitant, the 175 yes, sorry. attacks. Yeah, he has the uh, Stormcaller Baton, which he guides a Stormcast Eternal unit to be seven inches away instead of nine inches away, and that. I. Yeah, that yeah, makes. I started difference. reading a rule. I started reading a rule before actually reading the whole <laughs> thing. I'm like, oh no, that's 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 not what I was looking for. So thank you for jumping in and, and shutting me up because I was clearly <laughs> wrong. What I was trying to say. All right, I'm going to stop trying to pretend I, I know what your crack science was. <laughs> Tell me what this is all about. So you've got your Lord Imperident, you've got the Lord Relictor, who's the general, Masters of Magic, Arcane Tome. So you've got a little bit of magic on him as well as you've got some prayers. Uh, mm -hmm. Prayer, no surprise to anybody here, is translocation, and you've got the spell Thundershock. You've mm -hmm. got yourself a Knight Judicator with that free Griffhound with the Mirror Shield and a Knight in Cantor with the Lightning Blast. You've mm -hmm. got three units of three uh, Annihilators with Grand Hammers. You've got two units of Aether Wings, and then you've got a reinforced unit of six uh, Vanguard Raptors with Long Strikes. Mm -hmm. Is there any play with the Hurricane Crossbows at all? Um, uh, or... I, no, not at all. I just think they're... Like, if you wanted to switch to some crossbow fire for dealing with horde units like zombies i think judicators with crossbows are a much better investment than hurricane crossbows yeah it's just they're not point sufficient like when we compared their damage to judicators i i think judicators are the better pick it's interesting because actually like I, this tournament that i'm going to next week i was going to run gits and um one of the reasons i was going to run gits is because there's so much mortal wound sniping at the moment if i run like a levan type 200 goblin at your list six mm -hmm. heroes that are worth literally nothing um i don't care if you pick off i don't care if you do a bunch of damage i've still yep. got 100 200 bodies and i've been thinking about that horde meta i'm not, I'm not as resilient as levan obviously i can bring mm -hmm. back some models but not nearly well but i think that meta is going to shift soon you're going to start seeing durability whether it's in sheer amount of models on the table or you're going to start seeing ones that can handle like nurgle like soul blight um, they can take the punch and just smile. So I think Absolutely. thinking um, about not just yeah, fo yeah. like focused fire, like long strikes, there are going to be other options you'll need. Mm -hmm. um, and absolutely. I think the this list and I think Stormcast in general are very well equipped to deal with this hero monster meta that everyone's been playing into. People really like their small model armies and their elite count. You know, Iron Jaws are fairly elite. Um, the Zinch one is fairly elite. I mean, they all they do is run some basic horrors and all a bunch of like hero monsters and stuff. So if you're playing into their hands, Stormcast will just delete you. But I couldn't do anything against Levon's 120 zombies. I'm like, at max damage I could probably do on average is about 40. So I, I'm not going to kill a zombie unit. And then you're going to bring a bunch of them back. So <laughs> I'm in trouble. Um, so yeah, but this list is against most other lists in the meta that are trying to rely on key units. Uh, this list can perform really well. Yeah. Talk, talk me through the science here. So how does it all work? Um, what okay. what are the key pieces and how do they connect with other key pieces? Right. Uh, so we already discussed why we take Knights Excelsior. It's to make uh, the Annihilator's uh, battle line. The core of this list is formed with the Lord Imperitant and three units of three Annihilators with Meteoric Grand Hammers. 
the Lord Imperitant is unfortunate. I, I mean, I, in my opinion, it's a little maybe a tad bit overcosted. I don't know why he went up ten points from the Dominion box, but he's the tax you pay for a seven inch charge, which is really powerful, uh, and that's why he's in this list. Annihilators with Meteoric Grand Hammers have 10 attacks for the unit at 3s and 2s, negative 2 rent, 3 damage. So whatever they, plus the impact mortal wounds when they land, plus impact mortal wounds when they charge. So they're just an amazing unit for 240 points. They're not the best defensively, so whatever they charge into, expect them to not survive any sort of, uh, you know, counter, counter charge or repost move. But whatever they charge, they are likely to delete. They are just excellent offensive units in melee. Uh, the Lord Relictor is perhaps the best hero inside the Stormcast Tome. Having uh, movement, uh, like translocation, on a two-up is amazing. And I honestly don't know of any list that doesn't like using the Lord Relictor. Even Stormkeep lists will love him. Um, decided to go for the Arcane Tome on this one uh, to basically add a bit of spell utility in case uh, I face Iron Jaws or anything that tries to get close to my Vanguard Raptor Sniper's Nest. Uh, and the idea is to have a bunch of units be hit by that minus one to wound, because that's what Thundershock does, and be re basically reduce their offensive potential. The other play you could make is an offensive one, where you know if you know you're going to hit them with Annihilators, you can drop the uh, Lord Relictor with Translocation. He can translocate himself in range, and then hit the entire enemy army with a minus one to wound with Thundershock, if, if that needs to be. So that's that's a cool play you can make there uh, to debuff the enemy army before you hit them. Um, yeah, you don't often I, see you don't often see you don't often see a um, a Lord Relictor on the offensive. He's mostly at the back end, kind of just teleporting everyone around the board. Mm -hmm. um, that's what you mostly find. But it's good to see there's a bit of utility, especially if you you really need to lift an opponent and you need that minus one. Um, oh, absolutely! I actually used I, it against uh, the Gargan matchup. I translocated the Relictor in range of two Mega Gargans. Hit them with the minus one to wound, and then uh, charge my annihilators on one. And when he fought back, he basically couldn't kill them because that minus one to wound was so huge in uh, stopping offensive power. Why? Why would you take the arcane tome? Like, do you? Because I'm seeing this happen more and more, probably because of your your, your podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm seeing more and more stormcast players putting the arcane tome on the Lord Relictor. Mm -hmm. He's you know he's not he's not the most durable hero in the world. Why mm -hmm. Why on earth would you put the artifact there as opposed to somewhere else? Right. I think the main, the best way to answer is our spells actually have pretty good defensive and offensive utility. The only problem is all of our spells' ranges are restricted by whether you take them on knights or lords. So uh, mm -hmm. a knight encounter is a great example of a wizard. But if I were to take Thundershock on him, the range on that Thundershock would be 12 inches versus being 18 inches on a lord. And unfortunately, all our Lord Arcanums are absolutely horrible. Like their points costs are horrible. They're not great wizards. They don't have any great utility or anything. So the second best thing to do is take a hero which is automatically an auto take, almost an auto take in almost every Stormcast list, and then put an Arcane Tome on him to increase their utility. So it's a Lord that is a wizard and probably the best priest in the game. So. Yeah, no, no. It's it's funny you mention that because I, I, that was something that I noticed very quickly when I was building my list. Because I'm like, I'm looking at chain lightning, I'm looking at celestial blades, and I'm like, why on earth is there like, if it's a lord, it's this range. If it's a uh, a knight, it's this range. And I'm like, why on yeah. earth would I take a knight relictor now? I'm like, <laughs> other than it's a cool model, I'm like, eh, no, I'll just mm -hmm. go with the regular lord. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I don't understand why the Knight Relictor is 140. That seems absurdly expensive if the Lord Relictor is just five points above that. <laughs> like, I think yeah. a Knight Relictor should perhaps be around the Knight Encanter price. And then there's an actual choice should... to be made. Like, I yeah, hey, like, do I want... a discount. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, moving on. The Knight Judicator. Now, this wasn't in my Austin list. I was initially running uh, a unit of Liberators and Prosecutors. Uh, the Knight Judicator essentially came about because in the Gargan matchup, I found myself lacking the last bits of 3 to 6 to 9 damage. Uh, just that little bit of extra shooting, uh, because the Knight Judicator comes with two shots at 3s and 2s, minus 3 rend, 3 damage. So, so having that extra bit of rend and shooting really helps you help, help me like reach that DPS crest, you could say, that I needed to reach against some of the more heavy DPS check matchups. Uh, and the other great thing about him is that if you put the mirror shield on him, he's the perfect counter to a Stormcast mirror that is also running long strikes. 
because if this guy is on the field, those Raptors cannot shoot him and he can shoot them. So you will pop three Raptors a turn with this and they, he cannot be shot. So that was my, okay, how do I counter a uh, another Stormcast player who's running long strikes? Because that matchup comes down to, oh, hey, I deployed my Raptors and Scions. Okay, you did as well. Whoever drops his Raptors first loses, basically. <laughs> So yeah, we saw that we saw that the LVO where dragon upon dragon, it seemed like uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it seemed like uh hallowed knight dragons would often beat hammers dragons because they're a bit more durable. Mm -hmm. um, hallowed knights so you beat think the you... Tempest Lords, yeah. Tempest Lord dragons oh, Tempest beat Lords. the Hallowed Knights. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it, it came down to the five up ward. Gardas is just so good. Um, but you know, the other reason for the Knight Judicator is because he comes with a unit of three Griffhounds. And that does two things. A, it gives you another Scion slot. So a Knight Judicator counts as two units on the battlefield, which means you can put two units in the sky for one unit, for the price of essentially one unit, which is amazing as an ability uh, for utility-wise. And then the other thing is, I was afraid of other Annihilator lists or uh, another, uh, how should I say, like more things like trans uh, coming in from reserve in my face or like coming on reserve board edge like Nurgle likes to do. Um, and so I decided, hey, let's just take Griffhounds because he comes with two free Griffhounds. And if something tries to come in from reserves or is summoned in front of me within 12 inches, I get to shoot them with the Knight Judicator, the Raptors, and that little baton thing that the Imperitan has. And that, that triggers per instance of them deep striking, yeah. which will wreck armies that are trying to close that gap by uh, summoning reserve units. I used to use that all the time in first edition. Because back in the day, it's funny actually. It was Brent Wood was talking about the meta. Uh, thank he said, "God, thank God for the meta." Because players now have like historical battles within AOS, and I, I did have a laugh because I, I feel like an old time war veteran. Like back in the day, back in first edition, <laughs> but in first edition, um, you know, for anyone who didn't play, you used to take Griffhounds as singles, so you you it wasn't a block of six. So it yeah. meant that I could take I could take three Griffhounds and I'd put two on the one on the flanks and then I have one in the center and that would create a nice little bubble that I could always get any deep striking or reserves I'd be able to do the you know the the doggo scream and um and, mm -hmm. and do shooting but I always found it a bit tough with the the units of six um so this you know the night judicator bringing in those free Griffhounds you know the was it the um. What was that Silver Towers model? Because it used to come with one free Griffhound. Right. It was nice. So, yeah. So all those old Griffhounds, the little companions, they got switched to not have the keyword at all. Yes. They became part of the model. Because I think I think they thought the effect was too strong uh, to to have just the like anti-deep striker just attached to this hero. Um, so but so the Night Judicator's Griffhounds are separate from him, so they can move independently across the field, which gives you a little because I don't know if you've noticed, the list is very elite. It doesn't have a huge footprint. So you don't need to cover a whole lot of area with the Griffhounds. Just, you know, just outside of where people might threaten your Raptors or a Night Judicator. And that's generally good enough. Um, and this, yeah, it keeps people on their toes with summoning and uh, reserve units. So this was a bit of anti, you could say, anti storm cast, anti Nurgle tech. Uh, and then the Night Encanter. Um, with the lightning blast, uh, the night encanter's main purpose is the void storm scroll, which auto dispels once a uh, spell once per game, uh, and this is basically for those magic heavy matchups. Like if I'm facing Teclis uh, for his protection of Teclis, or uh, Zinch with the umbral spell portal, then that's what the night encanter is there to do. Her secondary function is to act alongside the vanguard raptors with the lightning blast spell to try and remove some screens because it's just you pick the closest unit and it takes d three more wounds and goes off on a five, so it's a nice bit of chip damage there. Yeah, the Knight Encanto is a good, a really good model. I love that it's also a, a very highly armored wizard. I think that's why mm -hmm. I, it was one of my allies in Cities of Sigma all the time because mm -hmm. three up, three up armor save wizard once per battle unbind. Many people are building, not all people, but so, many people are building like battle regiments. They want to go alpha. They have some type of tactic, as you said. They have Umbral Spell Portal. They have Soul Screen Bridge. They have some type of mechanism a critical spell that they want to get off and at least this doesn't leave it to chance it's just like boom you're gone it's not happening mm -hmm. is there any other key spells maybe for the folks at home who maybe aren't as tor tournament hard as you 
you know, so you mentioned to look out, at least if nothing more to look out, right? Because Umbral Spell Portal in Gloom Spike Gits is it really nearly as powerful in some other factions? Mm -hmm. Are there any critical spells to look out for? So, like, if you happen to go against Nur uh, um, Nagash, Hand of Dust is a great example. You've, mm -hmm. you've always, already mentioned Teclas. Um, mm -hmm. Daughters of Cain, Mind Razor is one maybe you don't, you want to stop. Any others Absolutely. you'd probably consider? Actually, I don't think I care about Daughters Mind Razor because anything they're likely targeting in your army with that they're in combat with, they will kill. It's the Shadow Dance, the one that lets Marathi or a, another unit just Should, teleport yeah. in front of your face. So there are key spells to watch out. So I would say, yeah, uh, Shadow Dance with Daughters of Cain, Umbral Spell Portal from Nagash or Kairos Fate Weaver, uh, Protection of Hish or Protection of Teclas when you're fighting Lumineth. Um, if you're really worried about, uh, oh goodness, what's that? Uh, if you're fighting Slaves of Darkness and they have that spell that lets them reroll hits and wounds, uh, that might uh, be yeah. something you might want to look into. Uh, I, I can't remember the name of the spell, but it's pretty good. Um, and then, and then there's some, um, and then sometimes it's not about unbinding a key spell. Sometimes it's just about unbinding a Mystic Shield automatically. Like let's say you really want to kill a Maw Crusher, and they have a uh, Mystic Shield from their Shaman or whatever that goes off on a ten because they cast it on a ten. You're like, well, I'd rather, I really want to kill that thing, and now it's on a two up save without any all out defense. Let me just auto unbind that. Makes me makes it easier for my annihilators and raptors to get to it. So, uh, by the way, that spell is demonic power. Thank you, Jeremy, oh, right. in the chat. Yeah, yeah. I, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, oh yeah, of course it's demonic power. Like you hear it all the time. You know, like <laughs> do you, do you uh, do you auto unbind every mystic shield? No, but the trigger might be that you might see someone do finest hour, and mm -hmm. then you're like, right, okay, they're going in hard for this particular hero. You know, they're gonna probably get maybe put on Mystic Shields. There's maybe a plus two coming in now to the save. So that might be the trigger as opposed to looking at every Mystic Shield because that'd be no, a waste of an incantor. Yeah, it comes down to, do they have a spell that has insane range projection that I need to buy time from so I can kill enough things in their army to make that irrelevant? Then yes, you look out for that spell. Or do they have an insane defensive spell like Protection of Hish, which will really hamper my ability to do what I need to do? Then you unbind that spell. But if you're fighting something like Iron Jaws, and you know, if they have that teleport spell, the Great he Great Green Hand of Gork, then yes, you unbind it. But if they're not taking that spell, which my opponent Jeevan was not in the final eight of LVO, then you just unbind the Mystic Shield because that's probably the next best spell they have. Talk to me about the Aether Wings and Raptors. That was a popular mm -hmm. combination back in the ye old days. Um, mm -hmm. It seemed like people dropped Aether Wings in third edition, and obviously they mm -hmm. went up in points significantly. They went from like 40 to 50 to 65. Mm -hmm. um, why have you got two units? Because that could be something else, like that's 100, 130 points. Right. Uh, so, the so okay, so back in second edition, the main job of Aether Wings was to have a 2d6 move in the opponent's charge phase and tie down their units in the charge phase so they couldn't charge insanely strong ability like my so goodness good. like yeah like i faced a bone splitter player in 2020 at lvo and there was nothing they could do like let's be honest like there's nothing they could charge uh and the raptors just kept shooting again and again uh so this got changed to whenever a enemy unit is within 12 inches of an aether wing oh sorry of, uh, yeah of an aether wing unit then any and all vanguard raptor units on the field are plus one to hit them which means all your raptors for without a command point, will be on twos and twos hit going into that unit. Um, and so I took this for a bit of command point efficiency, because it leaves command points open for things like redeploy, for things like rally, for things like all-out defense. Um, then the other thing is, yes, this could probably be a Vindictor or a Liberator unit. But in my opinion, what was happening was any dedicated melee army that wanted to charge me or like get got close to my castle had the means to kill that Liberator unit anyway, so I might as well lose 65 points over 115 if I'm going to lose them. And so, so they're... Yeah, so they're good screens, uh, and they're fast movers. If, if late game you need to achieve a battle tactic, uh, you can, you know, just... They're in the Vanguard Battalion, so you can once per game auto-run them 18 inches, uh, and they fly, so they can basically get to qu objectives really quickly or get to the opponent's backfield really quickly. Um, and yeah, that's why I like them. And then the Vanguard Raptors. And I was gonna. Yeah, uh, 
But yeah, please, no, I, was just, I was just going to ask you about, about the Aether Wings because I think maybe just, just for any clarity for anyone who might be wondering, and I think you've unpacked it a little bit, if you just want a source of plus one to hit, you might be thinking, why don't I just take the Knight Azeroth? Because it, it offers the same type of com, you know combination. But mm. what you're telling me is you're also getting two extra units, good for stealing objectives, could be really good for um, for clogging up the board or you know denying your opponent a charge. If they die, they're not battle lines, so you're not giving away broken ranks. Could be a great, you know, two units to score yourself, score yourself Savage Spearhead. Um, there's a lot more utility in having two Aether Wings than another source of plus one, I guess is the call out mm -hmm. here. And the other thing is, uh, like I said, the main core of this list is to have all your hard-hitting units be on twos and twos. So Aether Wings allow Vanguard Raptors to be on twos and twos without a command point, which leaves a CP free for the Knight Judicator to get plus one to hit using all-out attack, which means mm -hmm. the Knight Judicator will have two shots at twos and twos, minus three rent, three damage. And that just adds, just it's, it's just about maximizing those little points of efficiency and just being as efficient with your dice rolls as possible. Obviously, it doesn't help any long, long striking. So if you're going for an opponent, you know, 30 inches out or 24 inches out, different story, you've really got to be within 12 inches of what you want to shoot, right? Mm -hmm. so, so it's actually great because I will deploy my Aether Wings as far up as possible during deployment, and then I'll either translocate them or I'll run them. So they'll move 18 inches, which means effectively I have a 30-inch range on my Aether Wings sphere of influence, you could say. Okay, so if you if you put them into reserve through Scions, then you're going to be able to drop them down within mm -hmm. 9 or just outside of 9, which is still going to yeah. be within 12 inches of the rule. Perfect yeah. plus 1 to hit. So, it's, mm -hmm. so it makes it harder if you put them on the table, but if you're putting them in Scions, then I see where you're going with this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, the Vanguard Raptors, because like we discussed, the main weakness of the Gavriel Sherhart list is the inability to deal with things that are behind the screen and the inability to deal with screens without committing over committing points to it and so the vanguard raptors with thunderbolt volley are basically there to pick key targets that are behind screens uh key heroes that might affect the flow of battle for your annihilators if you don't deal with them so things like um a battlesmith for instance and then you know it's just good range projection because i think going all in on melee and stormcast Unless you're just spamming dragons or something, uh, might might be it might be an error because you really need that ability to project power behind a screen, and melee stormcast alone uh, does not achieve that. And that's perhaps one of the reasons why dragons are seeing so much play because they're a dual unit. They have the melee damage and the shooting damage to do what they need to do. Who's the model in this list that you worry about losing the most? Um, what's the, the Lord Imperitant? Here? The Lord Imperitant. So the idea is he gets to drop in one Annihilator unit per turn, uh, seven inches away from the enemy. So you cannot drop all three Annihilators and expect them to be seven inches away. It's only one per turn, which means in order to maximize efficiency, uh, he needs to survive the first three turns. Because your Annihilator drop, turn two Annihilator drop, turn three Annihilator drop, and you need to drop your Annihilators before turn three or by turn three, because after that, they're dead. You can't hold them in reserve uh... anymore. So if the Lord Imperitant dies, then the Annihilators are forced to come in nine inches away, which a nine inch rollable charge is okay. It's not the efficiency this list needs because the Annihilators really need to be hitting what they need to be hitting. And you don't have the go Battle Mage to get the plus two. So um, mm -hmm. should you lose the Lord Imperitant, then you don't have that consistent seven inch charge. Mm -hmm. um, would you would you consider having the Gur Battle Mage? I know Stormkeep talked about it. I love um, when you guys brought it up. Being a City's player, I'm like, lol, first edition. I've been using this bad boy forever. But it was good that you guys caught up Stormcast. Yeah. Why, I, why is there no plus two? Why, why not make it a five? Um, I think because the Annihilators innately reroll charges without a command point when the turn they land. So a seven inch rollable charge is the equivalent of, I think, rolling a two up on a single dice which you can fail, like you yourself mentioned, your friend failed a translocation uh, one into a one. It can happen, but it's uh, most of the time it's pretty reliable. Out of 21 Annihilator charges that I made at LVO, I think I only failed one of them. So uh, yeah, the list did what it needed to do. Now, the way to protect the Imperitant is I hold him in Scions, and I usually I drop him 
on some weird corner edge or behind some terrain where he can't be seen or shot and then drop the annihilators and then he's generally pretty safe for the rest of the game so he's never really in the line of danger uh the way i play him so according, according to tactical command they're saying that uh, a nine inch re-roll is about a 50 percent chance a seven inch re-roll is about 80 percent chance so the uh, imperaton is key which then leads me to jonathan's question or comment around well wouldn't it be better to have the mirror shield on the lord imperaton uh it would be i just found that if the players are trying to focus your Lord Imperitant with any amount of serious range projection, you are already probably winning the game. So I, I, I don't see that happening. What I'm really afraid of is fast movers getting to the Lord Imperitant in melee. I'm not too worried about shooters because he is a seven wound model on a three up save. And I, if I know they're going to target him, I'm going to put him, when I drop him, I usually drop him in terrain. So he has cover. So he is on a two up save. And then I'm going to give him all our defense, which means unless you have a way to deal lots and lots of mortal wound with range projection or just an insane amount of range power, you're not going to kill him. And if you are in interested in killing him, great. My Vanguard Raptors and my Night Judicator are alive and they'll keep shooting you and they'll keep doing what they need to do. Plus whatever Annihilator unit I just landed there. If you don't deal with that, that unit will kill your army. So I don't find my opponents ever really focusing down the Lord Imperitan because they just have bigger problems to deal with. Who 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 did your opponents focus on at LVO? Was uh, it the... they tried to the Vanguard Raptors and whatever Annihilator unit was in their face usually? That's what I would have expected. I would have expected that um, you want to get to those long strikes as quick as possible. Um, when you start dropping down those Annihilators, handling them, and obviously I can't handle them until they're down, so I've just got mm -hmm. to wait for you to to come towards me and unleash hell and do the best things I can possibly hope for the double turn and. You know, if I hadn't killed them in combat, kill them on, on the return surf. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, it, it's interesting because, yeah, people ignore the the Aether Wings. People will probably ignore the the, the support heroes and mm -hmm. um, and probably probably that once per game 30-inch, uh, was it Night Adjudicators? No, yeah, no, yeah, the Night Adjudicators shot. Um, that's probably the, Yeah, the, the well. orbital cannon. Yeah, the orbital cannon. Yeah, exactly. If you're comping up a bunch of support heroes... Uh, and I can combo that with the Annihilator. So drop the Annihilator, do the Mortal Wounds, uh, then use the Night Judicator to do a bunch of area of effect Mortal Wounds. Then yeah, that's that's also a problem that they need to consider. And to Stormkeep's point, yes, uh, in the sequence that I was talking about, 100%, you can't do the Wild Form to get the plus two to the cast because mm -hmm. it would happen in the Magic phase. Then you would have, obviously, you drop them down so that you can't cast on something that's not in the table. I was thinking more when it was on the table. Um, should you find yourself in a position for turn three and like you've got to drop down everything? But uh, yes, that combination, as we we're talking, would not work. So good right. And the other thing is like it, that combination is actually wonderful. It's actually the basis for one of our other lists. But the reason I wanted annihilators is because of the mortal wounds up front. So I really like the fact that when you drop an annihilator unit, you do mortal wounds to everything within ten inches on a three up. It's a D three. Um, and that hits quite a few units if you position your annihilators correctly because they have such a small footprint, three 40 millimeter bases in a triangle, they can hit a whole lot of units in your opponent's army. Um, and that's really what pushes them to combo with the Imperitan instead of the Battle Mage because they lose out on those impact mortal wounds if you are trying to translocate them with the Battle Mage. Um, but the Battle Mage is excellent for Dracots. Like if you're running Fulminators and you want to do that, I'm going to translocate these and hit your Gargant, Battle Mage go for the battle mage yes that's it's the translocation wild form combination it's not scions scions is not the combination you want to be doing this with so um good shout good shout by the way brent thank you for the super chat appreciate the dollar dues i can uh probably for america two dollars american i can probably buy um i don't know i'll work something out buy myself a can of coke <laughs> much appreciated Big big question uh, about annihilators though. Why would you not? You know, and this come up in the chat, and um, the stormkeep did respond to the person, but I think it's a worthy comment to bring here. Is if annihilators are so good, why wouldn't I reinforce them? Their battle line, so I could reinforce them up to a unit of nine. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't I do that? I think the reason you didn't do that is they're too expensive. A unit of reinforced annihilators, like first of all, nine would be something like seven hundred and twenty points. And while that's an insane Death Star unit, it's not very survivable, in my opinion. Like, 
I don't think like Age of Sigmar has progressed to the days where lethality in the game with mortal wounds and rend is good enough to where a three up save doesn't cut it or it doesn't cut it as well as you think it should. Um, and the other reason is sometimes I find six grand hammers to be overkill, like six mm. grand hammers with 18 attacks uh, or 19 attacks at, you know, negative two rent three damage. Generally, I found it a bit overkill against everything but Gargants. And since that's only one matchup, having to tool six grand hammers just for that one purpose uh, just doesn't appeal to me. And the third reason is the seven inch rollable charge is something you can fail. So if you fail that charge, now you have six Grand Hammers sitting in the middle of nowhere. That's 480 points that hasn't achieved anything. So if it's your opponent's turn next, or if they double you or something, that 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 little squad is dead. And now you spend 480 points doing nothing. So it's a bit of a risk versus output assessment. With the two-inch range, are you at least tempted to reinforce them once to a unit of six? Um, could play, repeat that. Sorry, you broke up a little bit. Oh, sorry. I said um, with the the grand hammers, do you, with the two inch ranges for the grand hammers, are you tempted to reinforce them to be a unit of six? Uh, we were initially, yes. Um, what we found was in uh, the first iteration of this list with the Gargant matchup, um, they just weren't doing the damage necessary to bring down a Gargant reliably. Um, and then this was also the time when Archeon was in the meta and him on a two up save just absolutely just not caring about any sorts of damage thrown at him so we're like okay we'll reinforce a unit of six go to a unit of six grand hammers and then archeon got taken out and then we discovered that with the knight judicator if you just play a bit patiently you're fine in that matchup it's not the worst matchup to have just with single units of annihilators uh and the knight judicator really helps out in that last bit of extra little you know at minus three rent three damage uh, to help you win that match. Um, so I would still stick with minimum units. I think if you fail the charge, it is so devastating to lose a 480 point unit that uh, I don't know if I'd take that risk, but it, that's, it's your it's mileage a, may vary. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of risk versus reward and you, you got, you've got to plan out to what happens at your worst as not just what happens at your best. Alex, by the way, Alex Martin, thank you for the donation and super chat as well. Um, much appreciated and it kind of leans into as well like you know there's there's a lot of great ways to build and you know jonathan was asking you know dracoline's yay or nay um uh, if nay, jonathan. Why? And, and, and jonathan is a kitty cat like he in second edition he was running blocks of six and he loves his kitty cats i think at one point he wanted to run two blocks of six kitty cats yeah jonathan i'd say nay for now and it's not that they're a bad unit i think they're a really overcosted unit um, if you look at the damage of, I don't know, six Gorgruntas for, you know, their initial points, which is, I think they were, I can't believe Gorgruntas are 150 because the damage on those is insane for 300 points. Or if you look at a unit of Fulminators, Dracolines just don't match up. So I don't think they need to be 280. I think, I think if they raised the Fulminator points by 20 or 30 and brought down the Dracolines by 30, that would probably be where I start playing Dracolines. But right now, probably not. I think that's probably a comment for the entire Soul Wars range. That second edition, I, I look at, you know, sequiturs and evocators and majority of the stuff that came out of that, that wave of Stormcast feels mm -hmm. overcosted. Um, Cause yes. like a lot of people have said to me, like, you know, I don't want to do liberators. I don't want to do vindictors, you know, that middle ground. I, I, I love them. And I'm like, like you run them if you want to. And by the way, the list that McGonk showed us, you know, it's not the only way to run, you know, Grand Hammers. Like you do you, you know, uh, someone was talking about having uh, Karas, uh, Krondus, Krondus for a minus one bubble and to clear hordes. Cool. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. no, don't, no, we're not saying don't do it. Um, this is just one example. Yeah, uh, I think I think the entire Sacrosanct Chamber was in a lot of ways carrying the Stormcast book from second edition and GW in their standard practice of let's nerf what was good previously um, have sort of nerfed Sacrosanct into the ground. The only thing that from like, I was surprised the Vanguard Raptors actually, they buffed them. <laughs> they were like, okay, we haven't sold enough Vanguard Raptors. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's make them better. Um, but no, uh, I'm really sad about Sacrosanct taking a hit. I really, really like the Evocator and Sequitur models and to see them a, get a nerf as far as weapon ranges are concerned, and then also take a nerf in terms of their cost was, yeah, it's a, it's a bit sad. 
But if points is the only issue, it can easily be corrected. And, you know, hopefully they fix it next GHB and we see more sacrosanct on the field. Do you think it's a points issue? Like for anyone here who's really passionate about their sacrosanct, um, mm-hmm. if points were adjusted fairly, let's say they brought them down in line to what we probably would expect for X units. Yeah. No, do yeah. You, I think they're think perfectly fine. See... Yeah. yeah. I think they are, they are good alternatives. Um, I'm not going to say they're the most competitive. Like I, I can't make that assessment, but they are perfectly viable armies to play in your local tournament scene. Because if evocators were from 230 to 200 points, if Dracolines went down to 240 or 230, if sequiturs maybe came down 20 points, suddenly those units start becoming a bit more efficient if, compared mm-hmm. to the rest of the range. Right now, they're just absurdly costed as if, you know, maybe they're, I, I, I'm not entirely sure what the reason is, but like you take the example of the Lord Exorcist, who is a one cost wizard with a ability that stops resurrection within nine inches. He's a 180 point wizard with no special abilities, but that for one cast. And when you look at that and you're like, well, what was the thought process here? Yes, the ability is really good, but is it worth 180 points for a one cast wizard? And the answer is probably no. So there's a lot of that going on with the Sacrosanct Chamber in general. Yeah, no. And, and this is the thing, like, you know, you, you look at the Stormcast book and there's some units that are great value and there are some units that are just minor tweaks away to seeing seeing the, the table, right? You know, mm-hmm. people have thrown around castigators. People have talked about, you know, the Stormcast chariots. I really like the chariots. I don't know why people are not running them. It seems like we talked about them really good, like mini Stonehorns, and then we stopped. We stopped running them. I think. I think the. I think there's something happening in. This is not a Stormcast problem in general. It's something that's a 3.0 problem in general, which is if something it doesn't find a way to be battle line, it's very hard for it to see play. And it's sort of becoming like this thing where they're making more and more things battle line. Like we're seeing turtle battle line. We're seeing magma drop battle line. We're seeing, you know, so it's all about shaving points and being efficient. So if something, and that's perhaps one of the problems like Paul pointed out in the comments, of, uh, sorry, the Stormkey Key pointed out in the comments about uh, Dracolines and Evocators, they have no way to be battle line. If there was something mm-hmm. that made them battle line, say that one really unused chamber called, uh, not chamber, Stormhost called uh, Celestial Warbringers, because by the Lord, they have the most amount of sacrosanct chambers in their little storm host. So if they had a way to make evocators and dracolines battle line, yeah, you would see more play with them. Absolutely. And I think it's that battle line syndrome that also might be holding a few units back. Yeah, yeah. You you are really seeing the the focus on battle line. One, because it fills the role. Um, because if you if you're choosing units that are not battle line, then you've got that, as you said, tax in the, you know, mm-hmm. in some of the lists, I think you were talking about, if you put it into, was it Tempest Lords or something you were mentioning, you'd have to have three units of Liberators in. That's Yeah, the old Gabriel that... Heart. yeah. Correct. There's exactly. 300 points that you would have, you know, you would lose, which is essentially one, one group of those Annihilators, which means you've only got two, which means you don't have nearly as much strike. So how do you find the most value? You're finding a good hammer or a good anvil within your battle line selection. Obviously, you get to double reinforce it as well. So it means should you need to in certain scenarios, you could go, your dragons go from two to four to six if you really, Mm -hmm. really wanted to double down on dragons or, you know, insert generic response here. But um, you are seeing more and more and more, as you said, Leviathans. um, There's a lot of things that Games Workshop said that's becoming battle line. And I wonder if this is about to become the trend that we're going to see just to get the maximum points efficiency from a list out since the points jumped in third edition, you know, things became more I, I expensive. I think so. Uh, yeah. I think, I think we're absolutely going to see more and more of these. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. Like at some point it feels like we're devaluing the, the role that normal foot troop battle line plays in the game. If we just make everything battle line. Uh, at the same time, it does open a lot of interesting options for lists. Um, and unfortunately, Stormcast being as elite as they are, they really, really needed uh, opening up more battle line options because it was the, one of the main things holding back the second edition book. The fact that Dracots weren't battle line, the fact that Paladins couldn't be battle line, you know? So. Yeah, and they've started opening it up, and um, it makes a huge difference. And especially with the reinforcement rules, that's where the problems start to become. Like, yes, you know, being able to take turtles or sharks as a a battle line, um, Mm -hmm. obviously it's an elite troop, and, you know, you love your sharks. Why do I take thralls and reavers? Well, I can do something like that. But 
it's often the reinforcing and double reinforcing that people are looking for. Obviously not in your annihilators, you're not trying to make them a unit of nine, but in other examples, it absolutely becomes um, imperative. Um, mm -hmm. Quick question from Flo. Um, how do you approach fast moving alpha strike armies? Because I think this is part of the meta that is underplayed at the moment. And we're starting to see dragons is bringing it to the forefront. Living cities is bringing it to the forefront. You've mm -hmm. got uh, Iron Jaws coming up. You're going to have Beast Claw Raiders becoming more aggressive. I think armies, as they respond to the shooters, they just can't sit there and be shot. So they're going to want to come mm -hmm. up into your face. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is about, there, there's there's so many answers to this, but um, it depends on, obviously on how the army moves fast. Uh, is it Are they doing it through reserves? Are they doing it through teleports? Are they doing it via double or triple movement? The main idea is always the same, is you do not try and get objectives turn one. You deploy as far back as possible, possibly can into a corner, as far away as you can, and then you continue to shoot key units and drop annihilators on key units and their army. And once the board is cleared up a little, they have to choose between either dedicating to attacking your castle and giving up objectives or playing the objective game on the board. And if they decide to do the latter, then you compete with them on those objectives with annihilators and raptors if they decide to come for your castle great translocate some units out of there and then start competing on objectives and points and i think that's generally how you win this game uh be very careful if like and and this is something that you know i can't really tell you you have to know via experience so like against iron jaws for instance maybe try not kill the mock go kill the pigs because the mock is a single model it can only be in one place at one time you know but if all their pigs are dead then yeah, there we go. Strunky just posted that comment. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's a, uh, we actually did a video on that. And I think that's a perfect guide on how to handle the typical alpha strike army. Yeah. The, the other consideration as well is um, sometimes I like to just do the opposite of castle and I split out the force because mm -hmm. often these types of armies just want to run as like a big cannonball, as like one big ball, more crusher with piggies at the same time or double keeper of secrets because you don't want to throw all your power and be a bit swingy you want to kind of if you're going to do it you want to do it really well but if you split your force out to two or even three they can mm -hmm. only focus on so much and then you respond especially with your deep striking or reserves or summoning depending on what faction so i think you know some good ideas there, there is no necessarily one way to counter but there's mm -hmm. some considerations and i think um someone who projects their power too quickly will open up spaces, especially for coming in reserve. You, Stormcast is a perfect, uh, uh, has the ability to respond to them um, yeah. because you can put things in reserve. Cool. I know you really want to kill X unit. Well, I'm going to put it in reserve. So the opponent yeah. then either might actually not go aggressive or you can avoid it and then you can respond appropriately. Yeah. And that's actually why I love Annihilators because the entire time, not my opponent has to be a be able to dedicate fast moving units in order to try and make sure they can deal with the raptors and go towards them. But at the same time, if they overcome it and they spread out too much, well, suddenly their backfield is free for my annihilators to land and just take their home objective away from them or kill their key support heroes. You know, so it's it's a balancing game, and you just have to know what your opponent is capable of and see how they respond to what threats you can present at the time. Cool. You, mate, you're a popular man. I'm getting lots of questions. So uh, <laughs> we will wrap up pretty soon. I've, I've got to go to work. You have to continue working. A yeah. um, couple of key final questions. If there's some questions, folks, put it in the chat. We'll wrap things up very soon. Jonathan asking, um, what would you do with your li with the list that you showed with us? What would happen if your opponent could take out your, your long strikes in turn one? What would you do? uh i'm so if does this mean that if they this is assuming they take care of them what what or... do you do if your opponent can take your long strike so obviously the answer is put it into reserve yeah yeah. the answer is you put them into scions if your opponent is running the 20 bow snake list which will most likely outdrop you sorry the 15 let's say 30 list. sentinel let's say let's 30 say 30 sen sentinels they outrange yes. you they can shoot you you can go line of sight yeah, they can teleport with the techless spell. Yeah, you basically put them into Scions. You make sure your Vanguard Raptors cannot be shocked turn one. And yeah, yeah, that's how you protect them. You drop them where you need to, and you shoot that shooting unit in exchange. Cool. All right, final question maybe, um, and I'll, I'll bring it up from Alex, um, and then we'll kind of bring it home, is, um, and this is kind of my thinking around the hordes, right? I think that 
the response to the meta at the moment is to bring hordes because then I don't care about your elite 10 mortal wounds because I've still got mm -hmm. 60 to 100 and my goblins, I bring back half a unit. So I'm bringing back 30, 30 goblins mm -hmm. every time. So for me, I'm like, lols. But in mm -hmm. this case, Alex has said, you know, in, he's, he, they're encountering a lot of horde armies in the local meta. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any advice dealing with those 60 zombie type lists? Uh, Especially because you talked to Levan, right? You talked to Levan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually, Paul and I talked about this. Uh, we considered a variation of this list where we drop one unit of Annihilators for a unit of Crossbow Judicators. And the idea is, so the list essentially acts in tandem with the Vanguard Raptors. You punch something with the Vanguard Raptors and then you hit them again with the Annihilators. It's like a quick one-two. Ability to have a bunch of just low impact, no rent shots that can just go through zombies with Crossbow Judicators, I think gives you that damage edge you need to kill 60 zombies because you're killing on average about 18 to 20 zombies with the Vanguard Raptors, about four to six with the Night Judicator, uh, maybe a couple with Lightning Blast. Um, with the Crossbow Judicators, you ought to be able to kill at least 10 to 15, and then the Annihilators will take care of the next 20, 25. So mm. the math sort of like adds up there. Yeah, I think, you know, I was talking to Gavin, um, who won that LVO, um, and, you know, he was mentioning that, you know, when he got into his list construction, uh, one of the keys was not just to purely focus on one type of damage. So don't just do mm. all mortal wounds, you know, have a diverse group of having some rend, having some mortal wounds, but also high quality high volume of set of attacks so if you just purely focus on just you know snipe damage from you know uh, um, long strikes for example or some type of just elite shooting yeah you're not you're never going to chip away with zombies as they regenerate and mm -hmm. you know like like you've got to think about the what you're going to possibly be handling yeah and i think that's where the crossbow thing comes forward because one of the things that i found the one of the main weaknesses of this list is sometimes your annihilators don't have a prime target turn one, but you have to drop one turn one because it's a waste not to, because you need to drop one each turn seven inches away. So maybe switching that out for something that is a more stable unit, something like a crosswood adjudicator or a protector unit that can maybe protect your little castle better is probably a better idea. And like we said, we're always you know tweaking and testing as the meta changes, and then we post the results on our little Discord and see what works. So it's always a work in progress. Which is, which is probably, again, a nice little shout out to say um, one thing I've really enjoyed with Stormkeys podcast that you've been doing is, you know, you're hearing your thinking and your meta and thinking about the, you know, you do tier lists every three months, it seems. So you can kind of hear how your thinking goes. And, you know, as, as the landscape shifts and changes, you are discussing those things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and because, because a couple of comments come up on the chat, which was an interesting one is that, you know, you've got to drop those annihilators by turn three. You've got three of them. So you're either A, dropping in turn one, and maybe it's, that's not the right time. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe only two is, is worthwhile as opposed to three, and maybe having, as you said, the crossbow judicators or castigators or having, I don't know, the chariot, whatever it might mm -hmm. be. Uh, although you, you need to fill your battle line option. But you know what I mean? Like um, thinking about what you do and how you do it and – you don't want to be dropping multiples in, in a turn. So, yeah, oh, I think, unless you needed to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other weakness of this list, and part of the reason I'm switching back to having at least one unit of prosecutors, is that annihilators are really good, but they cannot go up against dragons because the minute they get charged a dragon unit, they will get um, unleashed hell upon with uh, the dragon fire breath, which will absolutely clean their clock. <laughs> They're only nine wounds. So, if four dragons breathe fire on them, they're toast. So having a prosecutor unit to absorb Unleash Hell with the 3d6 charge and then charging an Annihilator afterwards is probably the play there. So, Yeah. I, I've been playing around with Praetors recently, and I really enjoy Praetors until I realized that it doesn't stack with Gardas and Hallowed Knights, and I cried. I'm like, stupid bodyguard <laughs> rule. Bloody hate them. <laughs> Bloody bodyguard rule. So stupid. I hate it so I much. Know. Yeah, I, it's, I, I, it's not even a bodyguard rule. It's a five of ward of another kind, essentially. Yeah, but it but it explicitly says it in like the FAQ. It's like, like yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty strong. Yes, I had this perfect combination of uh, Krondus with Praetors with Gardas, and I'm like, this is how I'm going to create this super durable dragon that's going to do you know wreck havoc on the table. And then I, I, I realized like, oh, this doesn't work. 
yeah <laughs> if people want to know more you have a podcast i want you to shout it out i keep talking sure. about it but i want you to <laughs> do your do your elevator pitch sure uh so uh, myself paul and james have a podcast called the storm keep it's on youtube we have all the episodes on there uh, and the links to our videos is a Discord uh, channel where we discuss new tactics, new kinds of lists. Uh, and there's so many different variations that people are trying out. Uh, we hold painting contests. Uh, we hold uh, you know, private sessions if you want to just know more about a list and how to play certain matchups. And it's a really cool community. So if you can, please uh, look up the Stormkeep on YouTube and join us on our Discord sometime. Do check it out. Do highly recommend it. They do bring a lot of great insights to the Stormcast community and obviously share a lot of good insights as well. So give them a sub. I'm not going to put your Discord. So, uh, like, go, go check it no. out. Is it in the yeah, videos? Yeah. Is that how I find it? Yeah, Discord? all the videos have it, I think. Yeah. Cool. I'm not going to put it in this video because I want them to go to your channel. Find your videos, hit a sub, and then follow. Um, thank you go man. go check out them out but you you guys have done absolutely great content um much appreciate your insights um but what else that's it that's it i think we could talk forever man this book is so deep <laughs> yeah so much stuff. i know like i know there's so much in stormcast but um i've really enjoyed my journey um general's handbook 2022 is when i actually properly get into stormcast um mm -hmm. Partially because I, I want dragons and I want to know where I'm standing. Yeah, I want to see. Yeah, this I want upgrade see through. Get... Yeah, I want to see more Thunderstrike. Like I, I'm expecting a wave two, maybe next year or late this year. So maybe, maybe then we'll see. All right. Final question, actually. Now you reminded me of that Thunderstrike in that. Do you think they're going to remove old cast? No. Do you think I... that there's going to be a time where they're going to drop the line? I don't think they'll ever drop the line. I think it'll be because they don't want to invalidate people's collection. I think what's far more likely to happen is it'll follow the same um, sensibilities as Primaris and Space Marines, where they first, when they came out, they were good, but not great. But eventually, Thunderstrike will become just the more efficient option over your regular Stormcast. And that's when it'll be more of a, do I want to play the models that I'm attached to, or do I want to play the new hot stuff? So. And by the way, thank you, Jeremy. Much appreciate the donation. I now can buy lunch um, between the three, <laughs> the three donations. But because I, I, I always wonder to myself, uh, this is kind of like the outro. I always wonder at what point do they do they change approach with Stormcast, and do they do they space marine it where you have actual multiple battle tomes for the for the army? Because you know you're at what 80, 90 units choices right now. There's yeah. going to come a point where the next release might bring you up to 120. Mm -hmm. At what point does it, does one battle tome no longer be enough and it needs to be split somehow, whether it's through chambers, whether it's going to be through armor design, as you mentioned, the old versus new. Because mm -hmm. um, it can't I, just honestly, keep growing. Like Otherwise, you're going to have like a tome this big. Yeah, I think it'll keep growing until they realize it's too much and then they'll either find a narrative reason to essentially move a bunch of units to legends where they won't be printed in the battle tome, but they will have an online PDF where you can refer to those war scrolls, sort of like what they did to tomb Kings. You know, there isn't a book. It's just the, if you want to play liberators, say six years from now, the war scroll exists inside a FAQ uh, index tome or something on the GW website, but for in well, all intents and purposes, it's the new Thunderstrike that's taken over or whatever we're in at that point in time. Yeah, interesting, interesting. There's obviously pros and cons. Like you could obviously go um, some of these, like especially, you know, some of these um, sub-factions, you could potentially fully flesh them out to be their own faction, almost like Blood mm -hmm. Angels and, you know, the Space Wolves. Yeah, I, 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 I don't like, I don't like the comparison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I almost think the they comparison. have that idea. Yeah, I think, they, I think they are planning something like that to eventually split each Storm host into that thing. I just think they haven't done it because... Stormcast aren't as popular as Space Marines in the 40k are. Like, uh, so it wouldn't make sense to do it. You would just be dividing your own little Stormcast player base by a lot. So, yeah, I agree. I think at the moment that was probably their idea in the early books. I reckon they mm -hmm. were trying to build out like the the Paladors, and or they were going to try to bring like the you know the Paladors were like the Space Wolves, and they were probably eventually. Yeah, but yeah. They've kind of abandoned it a little bit, so yeah. Um, I'm not too confident they're going to split it like Space Marines and. Um, but it, it, it has, something has to happen. It's becoming too big. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. All right, now now I can buy a drink with my lunch. Thank you, Brent. Brent much appreciated. I keep making these as jokes. I'm not I'm not like a stripper asking for your dollar and dues. <laughs> Uh, but all right, let's let's roll before we keep throwing more money at me. Um, this right. has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much again. Uh, well, go on, go check out the Stormkeep. They do live content. Um, they do upload videos that aren't live as well. These are pretty good release schedule, and you'll find their Discord server in their video descriptions, just like mine. Uh, Four thousand two hundred plus players in my Discord. So that's not a humble flex. That is a I'm the biggest boy in the land. <laughs> great to be on here thanks for having me coach <laughs> all right thanks everybody and like and subscribe and all that youtube stuff see you folks thanks for sticking around until the end i hope you found that video interesting and you walked away with a few new ideas if you did i would appreciate it if you hit like on the video as well as left me a comment let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below the conversation will continue over on Discord, so links down below in the episode description if you want to join the Discord and continue the Age of Sigma conversation. I want to give a massive shout out as well to these absolute bloody legends, these champions who have continued to support me through Patreon or YouTube members. That is going directly into supporting the maintenance and the growth of this channel. So thank you very much, guys. Much appreciated. And until next time, roll more fixes. <laughs>